this this topic uh, started to come up as we've been doing a um, show by show analysis and the research on suspense as part of the uh, su the suspense project, which uh, Frank mentioned. Uh, we we post a suspense episode in uh, much improved sound quality and lossless format uh, every day. Uh, most well, most of the time we've been uh, pretty good lately. And we, um, it's also a, a blog which has a background on, on the series and that particular episode. And uh, some of the people working with me on this are, of course, uh, Carl Shadow, uh, Don Ramlow, uh, Barbara Watkins, and uh, John Barker, and uh, Keith Scott, and uh, some others uh, pitch in here and there as we discover the, the history of the program in that particular episode. And then um, we, as we did that, we started to investigate who these writers were. And so many of, of the writers are not like any of the other series. It's um, part of the, a totally different strategy that uh, Suspense had, where because of the big budget, once they got a sponsor, uh, the first one being Roma Wines, um, they needed to get some very uh, compelling uh, stories and didn't want to go like many other series uh, do by hiring writers for their, uh, for their shows. They wanted to get as many different stories as they could. And an important part of that process was hiring someone named Robert Richards by, uh, by William Spear. He had known him uh, prior to, uh, to Suspense. And Richards was the show editor. It, it, he, it wasn't always a full-time job, but it did become a full-time uh, job for him. And they would screen a lot of uh, stories. They would make sure that there was a consistency to all of the stories in terms of, of the quality. And uh, also, they would solicit uh, story ideas from budding writers even if it wasn't in some kind of script form, but they would take a very sophisticated outline of it and turn it into a, a script. So when you hear on suspense, the story was adapted by, very often they did get it from that kind of source. Um, another aspect of this is that uh, it's amazing how many of the writers on suspense were young beginning their careers. I mean, the entertainment industry was was kind of uh, newish still, uh, but especially as as radio started to move on as, uh, with with the World War II building the the audience, and all, uh, many many people were attracted to this. So you had anybody who who had an idea for a short story or had a short story published or a novel, or whatever, sending the story concept into suspense, and Robert Richards and William Spear would go, go through them and make their selections for what, what would be on the show. So this was kind of different than the Whistler did. Whistler had a few writers that were really uh, regulars on that show. And uh, there's, there's also an aspect when people would send ideas into CBS, uh, very often um, they would categorize the shows as this is good for suspense, this is good for the Whistler. So, so uh, you'll see very often uh, someone who sent in something for suspense who got their script rejected and the, the script shows up on, on the Whistler just because it didn't necessarily mean that it was bad. It meant that it just didn't fit the format for it. So William Spear laid out in a very long um, two-page detailed letter uh, of what the uh, goals of the suspense story should be. So if, if you want to write a story for suspense, you would get this list of things from William Spear. And this is essentially it boiled down into to the uh, key points. Uh, they really didn't want detective stories that had detection. A detective could be in it, but it wasn't because they were looking for a specific person. They had to be just as flummoxed as everybody else listening to the program and be uh, surprised uh, by it, which, which happens pretty often. Uh, they didn't want horror unless it was believable. So horror for horror's, horror's sake wasn't uh, wasn't their game. They didn't want ghost stories. Uh, the listener had to have a sense that the, anything that happens on suspense, uh, they could be caught in. So um, a writer like Cornell Woolrich 
where uh, somebody does something almost innocent and then the world goes out of control for them. It has to have that kind of reality uh, to it. They didn't like bad, bad endings for innocent people. Um, so does that mean that he would have normally rejected sorry, wrong number? Uh, could have. He, he violated the rules pretty often that the script was really interesting enough. They wanted the uh, guilty party to get caught, but they preferred the stories where a guilty party was, was caught because of something that they really messed up, not because some detective uh, found them to do it. And of course, they wanted a, a star role for the big Hollywood star uh, that would make uh, people want to listen. So the combination of the stars, the good story, and the production, I, I don't mention the uh, suspenses music in here, but again, that is one of the things that really separated the series from so many of the other uh, programs like it uh, on the air. And uh, I've described it as um, it's often a, a character in the story all by itself. Now, um, just to get us started, some people may be familiar with the idea of using stage names or, or, or pseudonyms in their programs. And these, these are some of the ones that some people might know, but um, I'll explain uh, who they are. Uh, I.A. Finley and Peter Ashley, uh, William Norman and Christopher Anthony. Some of you have heard, may have heard me speak ab uh, about this particular person before, we'll probably know those. A uh, really funny one, only used once, Sebastian Moriarty. Uh, Catherine Lee may be a surprise, S.A. Bolt, David Williams, and the Bundy names. Most people uh, know who that is, especially John Abbott. Um, so I.A. Finley and Peter Ashley was the agent for George Burns and Jack Benny, but he started uh, working for CBS as a writer. And uh, that's when he wrote the script for This Will Kill You. And um, he... He preferred those particular names when they did it, and he chose a different one for each broadcast. I've tried to find out whether or not there was a Peter or an Ashley or some somebody in, in the family. I can't find any connection like that because that's pretty common. And that's what happened with William N. Robeson when he got into his uh, Red Channels uh, troubles. Um, he ha had submitted scripts. This is before he was a producer. He had submitted scripts and uh, they thought that uh, if, if they just didn't mention his name, it would be okay with Autolite and the others. So he used William Norman, which is his first and middle name. And then other times he used Christopher Anthony, which were the names of his uh, sons. Uh, Catherine Lee on Vam Till Dead was really Kathy, Kathy Lewis. And Sebastian Moriarty was William Spear. He was just being silly at the beginning of the hour long uh, series. Uh, S.A. Bolt and David Williams were used by Anthony Ellis. Uh, these were done while he was the producer of Suspense, and I have a feeling he didn't want to identify himself on the air as being the writer. He liked having a, a separate name there. And then uh, Jack Bundy, Jonathan Bundy, and John Bundy was Jack Johnstone. And um, we occasionally refer to him here as the, as the man who turned the lights out on Suspense because a suspense in Johnny Dollar on September 30th, 1962, because he wrote both of those scripts uh, for that day. Um, now we get into some of our interesting stories. Um, people who were, re were reporters had stories submitted on suspense. Uh, one was uh, Shirley Gordon. She was a writer for a radio and TV life a magazine. Uh, John Q. Copeland was uh, working for the Los Angeles Times when he wrote a short story. We'll get into him. And it would, at the time of the broadcast, he was in the Pasadena Independent. And Robert Mitten uh, was a writer for the New York World Telegram. Uh, Shirley uh, wrote two scripts uh, for Suspense. And she later even worked for uh, CBS after she left radio uh, life uh, and had scripts for The Whistler and On Stage. And uh, she eventually uh, did some television work and became an author of children's books. I thought this was kind of interesting be, uh, because when I read some of the articles about suspense from Radio uh, uh, Life magazine, they were usually written by Shirley Gordon before she had submitted any of these scripts. Uh, John Copeland was a crime reporter for the uh, Los Angeles Times. 
And uh, Copper Tea Strainer was a short story that he had written about 12 uh, years before, and he uh, submitted it for con consideration in the program. This is the program with Betty Grable. And a lot of uh, pre-show criticism of Betty Grable uh, started that she wasn't really qualified to be on radio and all that. And, it, and she does, delivers a, a really magnificent performance uh, on the show. If you haven't heard it in a, in a while, it's good to listen to. And if, uh, just a reminder, you can go to the blog and you can find it because we, we wrote about this show a few weeks ago and has links to the really nice sounding uh, copy of this. Uh, a really good sounding copy of this hasn't been around for a long time and we were able to get one. Uh, Robert Mitten was um, a book reviewer when he got out of uh, college, but he also won a MGM script writing contest and uh, had a year in Hollywood as an intern uh, doing that. He eventually left all of this and uh, started to work for Radio Free Europe, publish a newspaper and uh, became a PR director for Boston University. Uh, but um, he, he double, double entry is a very good and uh, very lighthearted story. If, uh, if you haven't heard it in a while, the 1949 one is the one with Eddie Cantor. And the 1945 one is with Hume Cronin. They're both uh, very, very good uh, performances uh, there. Uh, one thing I want to mention, uh, because they're writers, it's really hard to find pictures of them. Uh, you can find pictures of all the stars you want. And, um, but uh, it's in the 1940s, uh, photographs were expensive to reproduce and took up a lot of space. And who wants to read about writers anyway? Uh, so uh, you're you're not going to see many pictures of writers here, but we have one who did get in trouble with the law. Who uh, we have one. Um, some CBS employees uh, submitted scripts uh, for the series. Some of them went on to do some really big things. Larry Roman wrote Uncle Henry's Rosebush, which I, I don't think it's all that great uh, uh, an episode. But it was his first script uh, accepted by a network program. He was a page. Uh, at the Al Jolson show. Uh, there's another person who became a, a page um, who's coming up. And uh, for radio, he's best known for Rocky Jordan. If you've, if you've ever listened to um, the Rocky Jordan shows, these are really good uh, scripts. And uh, Jeff Regan has some, uh, has some really good writing, but normally that's associated with E. Jack Newman for, for many of the better shows. Um, he started to make some moves in the, in the movie business uh, with uh, Kiss Before Dying with uh, Robert Wagner in 1956 and has some other movies you may recognize there. So he had a very, very good career once he got started uh, in radio. Uh, Ernest Martin was an usher at KNX. KNX was the radio station where CBS, uh, all the CBS productions were done in Los Angeles. And he worked his way up the organization and uh, became a uh, head of network programming by 1946. So when, when he submitted the Palmer Method, which is the program with um, um, uh, oh, with Ed Gardner, um, which, is a, which is a funny uh, show um, and because of the way Ed acted, it wasn't neither show, he did an East and the West, and there are a lot of, a lot of differences, just to put it that way. Um, but uh, Martin later would leave CBS and get involved in Broadway, and he was behind Guys and Dolls getting that to uh, to Broadway and some other Broadway hits. So he he became a very big um, uh, entertainment uh, personality. In the picture, uh, you you see um, uh, Norman Corwin, uh, William Robeson, Donald Thornburg. Um, who is not a performer, and then not to write, you see uh, Mr. Martin. So he became a real big shot, though, with some of those plays that uh, he had. And he started as a page and an usher. Uh, Leslie Raddatz, uh, those of you who were big TV guide fans in the 1960s and 70s, probably the name is, is familiar. And he wrote the story with Edward G. Robinson. And uh, as far as we can tell, it's his only known performed or broadcast script. He was a publicity person. He worked at NBC and CBS, and uh, he stayed as a writer for TV Guide and, and Variety. So, but the name is, is familiar um, to those of us who used to devour 
TV guide every time it was uh, in the mail. Um, this is a good time to bring up his name. The last name Raditz is not a common name. And so when you go in a lot of industry directories, they not knowing him, uh, they spell it phonetically. And so you'll, you'll see it as R-A-D-D-I-S or, or something like that. Um, uh, we've gotten pretty good at deciphering these kinds of things. So uh, if you if you go to, for instance, Radio Gold Index, and you look up Leslie Raditz, you won't find him. But if you look it up spelled phonetically, you you will, as as you will for some of the others. Uh, Robert Jorn uh, was on a, a work for a lot of parts of CBS. Not a really high profile uh, position. But he did have about three uh, programs. Flesh Peddler is known because it's a DeForest Kelly uh, presentation. He was also involved in CBS Radio Mystery Theater doing 30 scripts. So he still uh, really enjoyed writing for radio. And then when he retired, he, it appears that he also started to write uh, children's books. I wonder if he knew Shirley Gordon. I don't, I don't think so. Uh, David Real uh, was also... Uh, in the background of a lot of CBS uh, productions. Uh, when CBS started a uh, film production business that uh, some in the industry claimed they were only making films to fill time on their TV stations. Uh, but if you look at the list of uh, films that were done by Center Films under CBS, some of them are pretty famous. Um, he, he was in production in a lot of different roles, both in, in Hollywood and also appears in uh, Washington, D.C. He wrote the show A Good Neighbor. Now we get into some more professional folks who were on the publishing uh, side. Um, these were people who's, uh, most of whom started their career uh, as, as writers of short stories. There were so many of pulp magazines that you find on the newsstands of all, all kinds of different mysteries, westerns, romance, and all that. And they were writing for, for all of them. Um, Mindrit Lord uh, changed his name from a Mindrit Loeb because if you remember the, the Loeb killers in Chicago, he didn't want his name associated with that. So then when he would say, Mindrit Loeb, oh, are you related to? He got sick and tired of it. So he just changed his last name to Lord. He um, wrote, I had an al alibi, which is a good show, and Wreck of the Old 97, which is the first of the suspense musicals. We don't think of suspense having musicals. Um, and they should have stopped with that one. That's a good one. That's with Frank Lovejoy without his Sheldon letter accent um, built on the folk song. And it's, it's done extremely uh, well. Uh, Lord was writing uh, plays in the 1930s and, and wrote an incredible amount of short stories, uh, but unfortunately he left us at age 52, as you see on the slide. Uh, James P. Keene, that's, um, that's the name of William Everett Cook, who was writing under the James Keene for many of the Western uh, books that, that he wrote. Um, He's another young one. He was 25 at the time that uh, his story, The One Who Got Away, is produced on suspense. So uh, there were, it, it could have been because the pay was too low for a lot of the more established writers to even try writing for radio. But many of them, if, if you were a young writer and you got on suspense and you could point at that as, you know, as being really important because you got through Robert Richards, you got through William Spear, and you had a big star uh, in in uh, your story, that's a big deal to get some attention of a, of a publisher. He was a very prolific writer and had a very good career. Uh, Butch Cassidy, Bruce Cassidy, I'm sure a lot of, I, I messed that up almost every day. They messed up his spelling all the time. Here's another one. They always want to make it Cassidy. It's Cassidy. Uh, the Strange Death of Gordon Fitzroy. He was 26 when this uh, started, but he was a writer for a uh, many of the uh, more daytime-ish shows like Gr Grand Marquis and, and Grand Central Station. And um, I was describing uh, the suspense writing situation to someone as, as suspense is like Grand Central Station, if you remember that line about all the different lives that cross in, in Grand Central Station. Uh, that's, uh, there are so many different writers uh, who went on to have either very successful or very tragic careers or very 
uh, wonderful lives or very disappointing. It's just it's such a mix of people. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, this guy just loved to write. When he wasn't writing, he was editing or publishing. He was always busy. And it was in all different kinds of things, whether he's writing about spies or doctors or science fiction or, or, or nonfiction. It's, it's, uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty amazing uh, career that he had just in terms of how prolific he was. And then there are the surprises. Uh, John Souter was a, a chemist. So he's working in the lab, uh, writing mystery stories. I hope his bosses didn't notice. Um, Donald Paul Nathanson, uh, you're going to be surprised at some of the things that he was involved in. Uh, Virginia Voland, uh, who wrote uh, 1960s uh, suspense script. And Walter Bazaar, one of the more interesting and better stories uh, uh, for the series. Uh, John Souter worked for Union Carbide. If you remember Ever Ready Batteries, you'll remember Union Carbide. Very, very big, big company. Uh, his story, Short Order, is uh, one of the more striking stories of uh, suspense. If you haven't heard it recently, Joe Kearns does an incredible, has an incredible performance. Gerald Moore makes one of those few appearances on, on the series. Um, and it's it's somewhat terrifying thinking of, of, about, about the plot line, uh, about uh, someone just scaring an owner into selling their diner so they could get it. Uh, Fragile Contents Death is one of my uh, favorite programs as well. So those are the only two that John Souter wrote. But he was writing radio plays in the 1930s. And he stayed employed at Union Carbide as he's, as he's writing short stories and novels and, and plays. Um, he didn't get past writing scripts until the mid-1950s when he finally got his first short story published. And then he had uh, a, a number of novels, especially after he retired um, in the 1970s, um, find, uh, find sales. Donald Paul Nathanson, this is interesting. Uh, this is uh, the, pro the program, A Guy Gets Lonely. Again, Joe Kearns is great in this one. Um, Nathanson was 30 years old when he was an advertising executive and wrote this particular story. But he was 25 years old when he founded a publication that would be sold to uh, radio stations for them to give to their customers, which was kind of innovative at, at the time. It was called Radio Showmanship Magazine. And if you want to take a look at some of those, you can go to worldradiohistory.com. I think they have a complete catalog of that in PDF form. Um, where it would explain the, to the stations how to sell programming. So Nathanson was, had a really uh, good understanding of what built good programs and the kind of ways that you engage audiences and, and the like. Um, eventually, he just got more involved with, with the advertise, advertising agency and then got involved in cable television and he, he became an extremely wealthy person because he owned some uh, cable um, franchises in the Southwest. But while he was in the ad agency, and we will never forgive him for this, he's the one who suggested that Tony Home per Permanence uh, sponsor Casey Crime Photographer, which ruined the series uh, for a while. And then uh, somehow he ends up working for Tony, I think is payback late, later on. But while he was in the advertising business, if you remember the products Dippity Do and Flare Pens, he came up with the names of those. And then the famous slogan, promise her anything, but give her our page. So he was a, a very, very interesting uh, advertising executive who, who knew more than just advertising. He, he knew marketplaces and media uh, unlike uh, many people, and he wrote this one particular suspense script. Uh, Virginia Volland was a Broadway costume designer. Uh, she began to lose her sight in the late uh, 1950s uh, and early 1960s, so she decided that she was going to become a writer. And so uh, because she knew touch typing, she was going to be okay and, and do that. And she wrote this uh, 1962 play, Pages from a Diary, which um, this is the one with uh, Jim and Henny uh, Bacchus. 
Um, but she was very, very big on Broadway in the 1950s. She was involved as a performer many years before that. And then on Broadway, she evolved in, in production design and also costume uh, design. And then Walter Bazaar wrote On a Country Road, one of the most successful uh, suspense plays ever done. It was done four different times on the series and also was on the suspense television series. If you have ever seen it on on the, the on uh, video, uh, that one has uh, Mildred Natwick and John Forsythe. And you, you know that On a Country Road takes place on a rainy, foggy night, right? So because they couldn't fit the camera to give them the profile in the car, they are actually driving around in a, in a convertible. Uh, it's in the studio, of course, and they're spraying water at them in a convertible in the rain because uh, television production was so uh, primitive at that time. I always thought that was very funny. Uh, he was a graduate student at Columbia University Journalism uh, School uh, while he wrote this. Uh, I don't think he ever wrote anything again for radio, but he became a very well-known reporter for the New York Journal American, um, especially for government, uh, government policy and science, mainly as it related to the space program. So you will, you will find articles by him in that. And then he kind of disappears in the early 1960s. I don't, I don't, I can't find out what happened uh, to him after that time, but this is one of the most favorite uh, suspense episodes and he did it. We had uh, three people as, as who became screenwriters uh, after being on suspense. Well, one of them was after their film career. Maurice Zim wrote the story behind Creature from the Black Lagoon, but he was a writer for uh, Murder by Experts and some of the other uh, shows like, like Family Theater. And then he got more involved in films and also some television um, like uh, Perry Mason. So this was, uh, uh, he, you, you won't find a, um, a movie poster with his name on it, but if you research the history of the, of the film, he was involved in writing the story that became uh, the screenplay. Um, Marion Orth was actually a film pioneer she was a, a writer in the silent era, um, and she um, wrote until around 1944, so she made somewhat of a transition to the talkies. We always hear about uh, actors who couldn't make it in the talkies because of something about their voice or something about their personality. And from reading about her, it seems that she she felt that you could do more in the silent movies and not have it questioned by anybody, that you could submit your script and that they would follow the, the plan for the shooting, but that um, in, the, in the sound movies, it, it was more complex and every day you'd hand something in and then it would come back to be something that you never expected it to be changed to. So I think she just kind of got tired of that. Uh, yet another case of her name is not correct in many of the um, many of the hobby references because when you say Mary North, uh, it sounds like M Mary North, uh, and so you may see her mis uh, misattributed in some places. She wrote the uh, story "A Lonely Road." This is after she left uh, films. Uh, Fred Freiberger. Uh, those of you who are uh, fans of the original Star Trek, you know that he is blamed for the decline of Star Trek in the third season when uh, Gene Roddenberry threw up his hands and said, I hate dealing with all these people at NBC. Uh, Freiberger had interviewed to be the producer of, uh, of Star Trek uh, before the show even hit the air. So they just called him in and said, hey, you, we, you interviewed pretty well, C come on in. Um, he also gets blamed for the second season of Space 1999, for the cancellation of the Six Million Dollar Man, and a whole range of other things. Um, but he had some really good times in, on uh, television uh, with, with some of those series down at, at the bottom there. And uh, he had two good scripts, The Long Wait with uh, Burt Lancaster and The Slow, Slow Burn with Dick Powell are, are good scripts. So, so he, he, he was a good radio writer. Uh, but uh, obviously the, the, new, the new opportunities of uh, 
television and uh, movies got to, to him after uh, those performances. This is an interesting uh, person. This this person is from Scotland. His name is Don Yarrow. And he wrote two scripts, The Shelter and The Eavesdropper. Um, uh, but he was known for his crossword puzzles. Uh, he was writing uh, crossword puzzles for the London Times Literary Supplement for decades and only stopped six months before he passed away. Um, so he was writing them. Well, at, at this time, he died, what, uh, 20 years ago? He, he was writing them from the, from the 1940s, uh, uh, 1950s. Uh, so it was, he, he was doing some writing for, for television um, in the UK and also here. But um, his crossword puzzles, that was, that was the thing uh, for him. Uh, another writer with a misspelled name in, in the references. And um, they they loved this person's work so much that when when it came time to put something on his death certificate, they just put the word the wordsmith, that uh, he knew more about writing than anybody that they, they had uh, encountered. So he had a very, very interesting career. By the way, the eavesdropper uh, was a missing suspense program. And... Um, and Larry Groby's uh, group, uh, Project Audion, did a recreation of it um, a little over a year ago. We have recently found a copy of the program in Armed Forces Radio Service program, and that will be posted on the Suspense uh, Project blog when it's, uh, when it's time comes. And then um, these are the people who were related in some way to the Suspense series who were also writers for the program. The first three of them are sound effects uh, artists. Ross Murray was probably uh, the, well, definitely was the most prolific of them. Um, he was writing for, for suspense for, for quite a while in the 1950s. Gus Bays did his own there and Tom Hanley wrote, wrote one. On the promotion for Ross Murray's first uh, broadcast, case history of the gambler the cbs publicity department and elliot lewis never missing a chance to get their names in the paper and to get suspense into the newspaper said that lewis had fired ross murray for the night because they he was so nervous about getting his first script on the air that they were afraid he would uh, mess up the sound effects of the show and uh, so they enjoyed uh, doing that. He obviously got over it if he had a, any problem because he worked on all these other uh, shows that uh, that he had uh, composed. Gus Bays had uh, one uh, script, Remember Me, which was uh, popular. They even did it on the Suspense uh, TV series. And Arctic Rescue is a, is a, is a good, um, good uh, episode as well. And Tom Hanley... Uh, uh, misfire. They're, they're all excellent. They're all very well done. And being in the studio, they've heard so many radio scripts that um, they probably learned what not to do just as much as <laughs> what to do. Pamela Wilcox. This is an interesting situation and gets into the personal lives of many of the uh, suspense uh, people. Um, she was the daughter of a famous British film producer, and she decided to come east, excuse me, west, although the world is round, you can go either way, come west to the United States and to become a writer in Hollywood. And she met Robert Richards. Uh, so here she is, 27 years old. She wants to make a big, uh, big impression in Hollywood. She meets Robert Richards, who's known as one of the best uh, scripters in, in Hollywood for his work on, on radio. Richards had already been divorced from uh, Sylvia Richards um, a, a couple of years before. And um, this is one of those situations where you think they should never have gotten married because uh, they, they're going together for almost a year and then they get married in October 47. And then six months later, they're, they're separated and they, they finally get uh, divorced in October 48. And then she went back to Britain uh, her biography talks about so many of the things that were going on at this time. Um, a lot of the names are masked, so you can't 
so somebody who doesn't know who the people are on suspense may not know who she's talking about, but you can start to piece together a lot of the things that were going on uh, at that time in Hollywood and also in radio. Uh, she had a very tragic life. Her her book is available. You can find it any you know variety of places, but you can borrow it from uh, the Internet Archive. That's that's the place where I found uh, it was easiest to 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 get. And uh, it's uh, it's one of those things uh, about the old, old saw about uh, may you have uh, may you have an interesting life as a, more of a curse than than anything. And she kind of did. Uh, but those are the uh, stories that uh, she was involved in. And um, in some cases, those were written by her and adapted by Richards. And there was some also some uh, work going around the, in the, the other direction. Um, this is uh, a surprise to uh, some people. Uh, some of you may have heard of uh, Ellen McRae, but you may know her better as Ellen Burstyn. Uh, because she was on suspense quite often, and she wrote two suspense, suspense plays. Uh, Elemental, uh, based on the uh, Stephen Vincent Benet story, and uh, Home is Where You Find It, which is more of an original uh, story. That episode uh, uh, was going to be the final suspense broadcast ever, until it got a reprieve a few months uh, later. Uh, but she was uh, working on... Uh, on Broadway, that's where she met her husband at the time, Paul Roberts, and um, because he was directing uh, that play. And then uh, when he was assigned to take over Suspense, when it uh, left uh, Hollywood and came uh, east to New York, uh, he he um, he was able to get her to be on uh, many of the shows as as an actor. Um, she was using the name Edna McRae at that time. So she, when she wrote these scripts, she has Edna Ray misspelled in some um, directories as Edna Ray, R-A-Y, because you can't tell when you're, when you're listening. And such an odd name to hear among, never, nobody had heard it before in the, in the scripts, the, the folks who were trying to, to put together the logs of, of suspense. But that was, um, that was her name. She was Edna Ray Galuli. And uh, at the time, Paul Roberts didn't even, wasn't even using his name. Um, his name was Paul Robert Botstein and Ella McRae, or Edna Ray Galuli Botstein. <laughs> she would kid people that that was her, her name. Uh, so the trivia question is, uh, which two suspense actors are among the few people to have an Oscar and Emmy and a Tony, and she is one of them, and the other is Thomas Mitchell. Um, now, uh, some people have a dark side. Um, it doesn't refer to whether or not the lights are on, but I don't know if you know the uh, name Elizabeth Highstand, but you may know something that she was involved in called the Cinnamon, Cinnamon Bear, which she wrote with her husband. And if you know the story, A Thing of Beauty, that is a pretty uh, pretty tough story. Uh, a lot of people like the second one with uh, Angela Lansbury uh, in the starring role. Uh, but uh, she wrote Cinnamon Bear, very successful, very nice, but Thing of Beauty is not very nice. Uh, her family was involved in a lot of uh, uh, radio broadcasting. Uh, John Highstand, who I think was her uncle, was an announcer for shows like uh, Burns and Allen. And she also was doing writing uh, for The Whistler and some other shows. Uh, but everyone associates her with the cinnamon bear. Now, the reason um, they do that, when no, this is the only time that she used the high stand name on a script. So it sounded like somebody totally different. And then we have people who sell equipment suddenly submitting a script to suspense. Backseat Driver was written by Sally Thorson, who was a very experienced radio performer and production person who started in Chicago, moved to San Francisco, and took a job selling uh, Sonovox production equipment, which is a, has a special effect of you can take the human voice and make it sound like something else. 
So if you remember the Bromo seltzer ads where it sounds like a train, uh, that's probably using that kind of equipment uh, for it. And uh, so she was selling this uh, in the early 1940s to stations. And uh, somewhere along the line, she wrote uh, Backseat Driver, which, as we know, the first two times uh, was performed by uh, Jim and Marion uh, Jordan. This is a strange one. Um, if, you, if you know the story uh, Experiment 6R, it's a really weird story where uh, there is a strange hotel guest who has rats in cages in a room doing experiments, trying to, uh, to create some kind of uh, antidote for uh, a poison or, or some, kind of, uh, some kind of disease. And uh, it was come up with uh, by these two folks, Donald Stubbs and uh, Harold Kamm. Stubbs uh, went to the University of uh, Minnesota, which is probably where he met Kamm. And uh, Stubbs was writing scripts and performing in a kid's show um, in the Minneapolis area and uh, was known to be a, pr a pretty good writer. Eventually, he would end up teaching writing and theater in, in college. And Kamm was um, a very odd person uh, who was known for this very free spirit that he had. And uh, he wrote a book called How to Break Into Radio. And uh, the book, it, you can see it on the Internet Archive. And it's got some really interesting things in it. You get a sense of what, what uh, radio was like uh, pre-World War II and how to get opportunities in it. And then uh, years later, um, Com gets arrested for sending obscene materials through the mail. But you can see this pattern kind of developing because he's writing for some really obscure publications, uh, things about uh, how much better off people would be without clothes and how, how to find lots of boyfriends and how to find lots of girlfriends and stuff like this. And he takes a, a lot of these things and he starts creating his own little publishing company and he gets in trouble. So um, he was convicted of uh, sending obscene materials through the mail. He can't get a job. He's known as a really, really good writer who can write about all kinds of uh, subjects. He was, he was, may have, you may want to consider him a pioneer in the self-help uh, for business uh, category because he, he wrote a lot of books about how to start a business with just a thousand dollars and, and, and uh, things like that. Uh, so he had trouble getting work. So he starts writing under the name Henry Sackerman. And by the time uh, of the late 1960s, a lot of the laws that he ran afoul of in the 1950s and early 1960s uh, had, had changed. And suddenly publishers are interested in some of these avant-garde um, uh, kinds of, of stories. Uh, and he starts making a go of it. Uh, so it's it's really an odd, odd story. He never stopped being a strange man. Um, he was known for being this counter-cultural figure in uh, Minneapolis. And um, it's kind of, uh, you know, the, a beat generation kind of uh, a figure there where he was involved with the creation of a, of a, of a very popular culture uh, coffee shop for the poets and the folk musicians of, of the time. And so he, he wrote the story along with Donald W. Stubbs. And this is the only time that I can find uh, Com uh, involved in, in any, anything like, uh, like this on radio. But um, that was Experiment 6R. If you, if you listen to that story, I wrote about it recently. It is one of the odder um, suspense stories. It stars uh, John Lund. And uh, if you stick with it, it's it's actually uh, pretty good, but it's not your typical uh, story. And um, there are some very multi-talented people who got involved in suspense early in their careers or just as a part of their career. Um, Anne Wormser was a writer who was related to Francis Cockrell. The Cockrell family was packed with people who were writers. Uh, if you've watched Alfred Hitchcock Presents, you'll see uh, adapted by Frances Cockrell. That was her brother. That was Anne's, Anne's brother. Um, but she was a writer uh, of uh, short stories, fiction, nonfiction. She was a ghost writer, did all, all kinds of, of things. 
But the name here that some of you may say, I, I know that name, is Jess Oppenheimer, who was writing for um, My Favorite Husband and then became a, a very key figure in I Love Lucy and all of the Lucy uh, spinoffs. Um, and um, one, one of the nice things that occurred as, as I'm doing research on, on um, this particular episode was I've been able to have some correspondence with Greg Oppenheimer, who's a big friend of uh, the old time radio uh, hobby. Uh, about his father and, and uh, things that were, were going on with with radio. Um, so um, this was a short story that they had written some years before, and it gets adapted for suspense. <clears throat> and uh, they ha also had some other things adapted uh, for, for television, that U.S. Steel Hour uh, a drama uh, was, a, was a story that they had written, was uh, adapted by by someone else. But uh, this is the, our brush with uh, I Love Lucy here. Uh, Murder in Black and White is a, is a pretty good story. And um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not one that you'd expect uh, suspense uh, to have. Um, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a look at what the young Jess Oppenheimer was doing about 10 years before uh, My Favorite Husband. Uh, Wormser had a very, very long uh, writing career. Um, Johnny Forrest, if... Uh, there, there are a lot of, of people who are involved in radio uh, who, as, as a business professor of, of mine once said, uh, at some point you're going to make a choice in your career. Do you marry an industry or do you marry a, a location? And he was the kind of person who he married a location. He became a very big uh, Seattle uh, performer, radio executive, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, music writer, screenplay writer, um, uh, in, in that area with many of the Seattle stations. But he did spend some time in uh, Los Angeles. He worked for Lux Radio Theater, but kind of a more of a backroom thing where he, don't, he doesn't get credited on air or, or anything. Uh, but um, one of the best the stories that he wrote was Mission Completed, which uh, starred uh, Jimmy Stewart as a, um, a paralyzed veteran with a uh, PTSD wasn't called that then, and um, it's it's a really really uh, good story. Uh, we posted it recently on the uh, blog, and a, a really really nice copy. It's worth uh, checking uh, that particular uh, one out. This is uh, one of the more curious ones. J. Douglas Ware uh, was a veteran, and his uh, sister worked at uh, CBS, and. Uh, Prior to the war, they used to talk about the different uh, scripts and stories that they might want to write together. He got uh, called to the war and unfortunately lost his life in combat in, in Europe, in the Air Force. And uh, she had started this script with him, uh, Tree of Life, and um, it was submitted for the show and it was accepted. Uh, it was originally announced as being broadcast uh, in November 1946 with Chester Morris, uh, but then a scheduling change to force that to become the beginning of uh, January, and Mark Stevens was uh, in the lead of that. And in that interim period, she decided that um, she was going to write her her brother's name as the author of the script, which she also did for a Whistler script and a script for Skippy Hollywood Theater. Um, so this got a fair amount of coverage uh, about uh, her doing this. Um, she was promoted at uh, CBS a, a couple of times, but would later become a Hollywood public relations uh, executive. Uh, she didn't do much uh, script writing, but uh, this is a good story. The Whistler story is, is, is very good. And uh, it's just a, the back, oh, so many times the backstories of, uh, of the suspense episodes can, some, can be better than the actual uh, presentation. Here's a dock worker some of you may have uh, heard of, Sam Rolfe, who was an important figure in 1960s television. But he was a laborer and he was also a dance instructor as he was trying to make his way uh, into the world. Uh, he wrote the script Too Hot to Live and one a little while later, uh, Dead Alive. But Too Hot to Live was such a favorite script, it was done uh, three times. Um, 
both, well, the first two times by Elliot Lewis, the last one by uh, Bill Robeson. He was also a writer for uh, Spade and, and Richard Diamond, so he had contact with uh, William Spear and, and uh, Blake Edwards. And uh, he was particularly good at writing Westerns and uh, got an Oscar nomination for Naked Spur, but also had some other very good Western movies. He uh, created the TV show Have Gun Will Travel, which, as we know, is a trivia question as what what radio programs were in television first. That's one of them. Uh, Tales of Tomorrow was another one um, before they went to radio. And uh, Herb Meadow wrote most of the uh, radio scripts for Have Gun Will Travel. I haven't looked to see how many of those he wrote for television. And he was a writer and producer of The Man from Uncle. So he, he has a very big part in uh, much of the uh, 1960s uh, nostalgia with, uh, with those programs. Joseph Udock uh, was a chemistry teacher. And he got an idea for a story called Spoils for Victor. This story has, this program really wasn't around a lot in the hobby. Uh, the 1946 uh, version was missing for a very, very long time. And the 1959 version was in really horrible sound. It was a bad air check. Uh, so uh, Joe Udek sends a script outline to uh, Suspense. They like it. And um, Robert Richards builds a script around his storyline. And uh, they tell him February 1946, they give him a date and uh, nothing happens, but it finally comes to the air in, in May. But he gets no publicity for this. Uh, just, uh, you know, Spoils of Victor is going to be on and, uh, and uh, make sure you tune in. So when we found that an AFRS transcription was um, around, uh, when you listen to it, of course, AFRS edits all of those closing credits out. So no one knew by sound who wrote the script. And when you looked at the original scripts at the um, at that time, the Thousand Oaks uh, collection, it was unclear who wrote the script. It had Udock's name and also Robert Richards' name on it. Um, some collectors started to think, well, Robert Richards had Red Channel's trouble. So so he he invented the name Joseph Udock, but there was a problem with that. Red Channels wasn't published until two years later. So you knew it wasn't uh, going to be that. And uh, William Spear liked the script so much what, in the year where, where he was running uh, Philip Morris Playhouse, um, you, you'd think that uh, Udock would get some credit. We don't have a recording of that program. But even in that publicity for the show, Philip Morris didn't do the kind of publicity that uh, Suspense did. There's no mention of Joseph Udock. Okay, so he got paid to write a script and he got extra money for doing Philip Morris Playhouse. He went on being a chemistry teacher. So Bill Robeson wanted to do the script again. Somebody lost track of Joseph Udock, um, because they wanted to send him a check. He had signed a, the, the contracts at that time allowed for extra performances and had a rate written in them. So they put um, something in the Daily Mirror. They got one of the columnists to mention it, uh, that they were looking for Joseph Udock because they wanted to do his script again. And they found him. So this is how we ended up learning um, who he was, and they laid it out in detail, um, but they laid it out in 1959. We couldn't get a copy of that, but they but they mentioned it in the blog, po blog post in 2009, what this story was, because the blog post focused on what was the news 50 years ago in Los Angeles in the Daily Mirror or the LA Times. So it, this is how we found out. Um, he was a, a chemistry teacher in Santa Monica, and um, they couldn't find his address. The newspaper got it, maybe because he was a subscriber, I don't know, and they got a check in it, and that's the last time we ever hear of Mr. Udock, except in a story about how to retire and not be bored from like 15 or 20 years after that. 
And then some of our favorite folks, our convicts, the people who wrote for suspense, but had their address as San Quentin. Uh, they're all, all got there in, in similar manners. Um, Jules Maitland, Elmer Parsons, and uh, Edgar Scott Floor. The only one who didn't go back to prison was Jules Maitland. Uh, Parsons and Floor did. The Floor one is a really funny story. Uh, Maitland wrote four stories. Uh, Phones Die First is about capital punishment, which is uh, kind of interesting about uh, delaying an execution. He would he would have known about that, and he wasn't there for a capital crime, uh, but um, he he would have known about it, even though he would have heard about it. And that's interesting because later on, when he became a film writer, um, he would write a documentary about Carol Chessman, who was executed by the state of California. Uh, um, so he had an interest in this particular area. And then those other shows, uh, Hold Up, Peanut Brittle, and Rain Tonight. Rain Tonight is a, is a good story. Um, he had started as a newspaper reporter, gotten involved uh, with some financial problems. So it seems like in the 1950s, whenever you had financial problems, just write a check. Right? It's like the old old joke, um, I, my, my, can't, my account can't be overdrawn because I still have checks left. So it, it seems like you can go to jail for that. Um, when uh, he finished doing all his work for radio and television that he could, he had really nothing to do. He couldn't get any work. So he ended up becoming known as a eulogy writer. So anytime a prominent or semi-prominent or a, a family wanted someone to give a eulogy, he would be there for hire. He made friends with as many of the funeral directors as he could, I guess. And he had a little business in that as he... Uh, as he got older. Elmer Parsons got in trouble when he was uh, 23, when he uh, was convicted of burglary and the Grand Theft Auto, he led police on a very, very long and protracted car chase. Um, he moved to California and uh, he, he also was uh, passing stolen checks and his excuse was he was waiting for money from some of the scripts he sold and they wouldn't send him the checks fast enough. So he needed, he needed some money. So he figured oh, I'd just write a few checks. Um, so he ended up in San Quentin becomes the uh, prison newspaper editor. And while he's there, since uh, some people may figure out who he was, he used the name Philip Race. And he wrote scripts for Sea Hunt, Bonanza, Flipper, others, um, Sea Hunt seemed to be a popular one with the uh, San Quentin guys. They liked the, that show for some reason. And then uh, it all goes uh, south. He uh, gets arrested for kidnapping and narcotics and, and finishes his life out in, in prison. And I thought it was interesting. This is the only picture we have of Parsons in the newspaper after his 1965 arrest. And you see he's covering his face. Because uh, uh, and it's a really big picture for someone covering their face, don't you think? And you have a picture of uh, one of his novels that he wrote as uh, Philip Race. the The funny one, if there is fun, something funny about this, is Edgar Scott Floor, who wrote under a, a bunch of uh, different names. You'll sometimes see him as Scott Floor, uh, or as E. Scott Floor. He wrote for some 1950s and 1960s TV shows, but um, the two suspense episodes that he wrote for were in 1957. Um, he, his family was familiar with the prison system because his father was an accountant for the state of Pennsylvania uh, auditing the, the prisons. And he got a degree in journalism. So he had a background in prisons and had a background in writing. It sounds like a great mix. And then as he wanders around the country uh, and heads south to Florida, he gets a job in a locksmith shop and he starts figuring out how to crack safes. And he figures, this is what I wanna do. So he goes across the country as a safe cracker and eventually ends up in California and he loves breaking into Safeway stores. It, it, it was like, if, if you were a Safeway store, you're crazy if you didn't get to change your combination or get a different safe. Or He was really good at whatever safe the Safeway stores had. Uh, he he claimed 800, uh, well, more than 800 burglaries, 
and he claimed to be the second best safe cracker in the United States. Um, eventually, they caught up with him, and they sent him to San Quentin. Um, he had an interesting life at San Quentin uh, because he was vice president of the chess club in San Quentin and also worked on the, uh, the prison newsletter. So he, he kept his uh, writing uh, chops uh, going uh, there. Um, he decides that he's going to write uh, some scripts. He, he likes uh, working for suspense and he sends them in. They like the scripts, but he forgets to include his return address. So a columnist in Variety is recruited by CBS to uh, mention that uh, they have these scripts from this particular person, but they need an address to send them a contract and to pay him. So much to their surprise, uh, Scott Floor gets in touch with them. And I just always found it strange. Who knew that San Quentin had a subscription to Variety? I, that's, that just seems so strange to me. Um, so he eventually does get out. He's starting his writing career in 1962. And he's um, writing is tough. There's a lot of competition out there and not everybody pays all at once. And sometimes you won't get paid until something is performed or close to some when something is performed. They'll just drag you out as long as they could. So he starts getting involved in forgery and counterfeiting again. And he starts forging stock certificates. The other funny part of this story is who broadcasts suspense? CBS. What's the name of CBS? The Columbia Broadcasting System. So what stock certificates is he forging? He's forging stock certificates for CBS or Columbia Broadcasting System stocks. He might as well pick something he was familiar with. Now, what were they doing? Because stock certificates were not electronically monitored, they were almost practically bearer bonds. If you had them, that's how you, you proved you owned the stock. They were taking these counterfeit certificates to a bank. And there was probably a collaborator at the bank. And then using them as collateral to get bank loans, which would never get paid. So if they had like... Let's say they had $10,000 of CBS stock. It may have been good enough to get a 50% loan on, on that stock. So they'd walk out with $5,000 and they'd never pay it back. And that's how they got caught. Um, it, it just seems odd that they would do something like that. It, seems, it seems, seems smarter to counterfeit real money. But, you know, counterfeiting real money, I would, they were getting wise to that at the Treasury Department. But counterfeiting stock certificates, that was really creative. So he's he gets arrested again um, in 1965. And he ends up testifying before Congress about bank fraud and how to prevent the exact things that he did. And he had a whole lot of other opinions about counterfeiting and the like. So um, he got to travel cross country, handcuffed, uh, to go before Congress. And that's uh, that's kind of where the story ends. But um, in jail, he wrote a book about um, betting on horses and the handicapping horse races. And it was a pretty popular book. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I don't know, if, I haven't been able to find a copy where it would have his biography in it, uh, if it mentions his counterfeiting or anything like that. But you've got time to study the, um, studying the uh, daily racing form in, in San Quentin, I bet. Because if they've got a subscription to Variety, for sure they're going to have a subscription to the Daily Racing Form, right? And then this particular one, this author, Third Jeffrey, this one I have to thank um, Carl Shadow for, for really helping with. Um, we did our best to find who this was. Couldn't find anything close to this in Ancestry.com, in any of the genealogical sites, in the census sites, in newspapers, whatever. It just seems like such a really strange name. And um, it was a popular story, um, Alibi Me. And John Scheinfeld, who was researching suspense in the early 1970s, who became a very successful film documentarian and still at that trade today, 
uh, finally got a chance to interview Ann Nelson, who is the business, business manager for Sense of Suspense at CBS. And she remembered that third Jeffrey was either blind or a mute. So they never really had contact with him. But Elliot Lewis liked the script and Walter Newman did the adaptation. But now Walter Brown Newman was nominated for three Academy Awards for his screenwriting over uh, three times over 30 years. He was one of the best uh, radio adapters uh, anyone could work with. Uh, the story was so good that it ended up on the Suspense uh, TV series and also on Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Um, so Third Jeffrey is used in three very prominent times. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Suspense TV series, it was one of the highest rated programs at that time, but not many people saw it because uh, in 1952, only about 20% of the population had, had TVs. Um, so he's just sitting out there. Who is this third Jeffrey? And they didn't care. They just needed a, a document to do it. But what's curious is what Ann Nelson said. It may have been that nobody ever spoke to third Jeffrey, that somebody else was doing his speaking for him. And it turns out because of Carl's research and, um, and something I, I gave him as, as, as a lead, I found um, in Google that there was something uh, copyrighted, a play in 1948 by Third Jeffrey. That was the only other reference I could ever find uh, for, for this person. And I asked Carl, you know, okay, now we got a lead. Can, can, you, can you look for this? And sure enough, there's a document in, uh, in the copyright records related to this other play, not the radio play. The radio play was never copyrighted. Uh, where Third Jeffrey is a, is a pseudonym, and two sisters who live together in Brooklyn, Ruth and May Brandt, are Third Jeffrey. And they had submitted this script to suspense for approval. Now, why they didn't do it under their own names, I don't know. Uh, they were not very successful in a lot of the other things that they did. They did get a script done on Stars Over Hollywood uh, almost 10 years before. Uh, they did have a freelance writing service that they sold to radio stations and to advertising agencies, but you, you don't get a sense that they were really successful at these things. But here it is, a really, really good script, and their name's not even on it. They don't change the name until 1967. And this is something that uh, Carl brought to my attention just this past week. So this is, as, this is the first time anybody hears about this in public, that third Jeffrey is Ruth and May Brandt, who lived in Brooklyn in an apartment with their mother and their brother, who worked in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and their story got on suspense. And that is the end of our strange suspense writers for the night. So um, I want to thank you again for having me. Uh, I want to thank Carl Shadow for that last item. But before we get to the q and I just want to add uh, a particular uh, message for everybody who's, who's on the call. Um, the suspense project uh, is part of a much larger thing that's going on in our hobby. Um, we, through the old time radio researchers and the personal context of so many people who are associated uh, with each other, we are, we now have a collection totaling around 40,000 real tapes. About 25,000 of them are in Florida. About 15,000 of them are in California. Uh, we have volunteers sorting through them. A lot of the reels are not worth transferring. But we're finding a lot of new recordings that uh, were never in circulation or fell out of circulation or are upgrades. Uh, so we have the opportunity, if we act quickly before many of these reels deteriorate more than they are, of saving them and getting them into a good digital format, FLAC, which is lossless and a very good, reliable format for preservation. And we're looking for people to help transfer tapes. Right now we have eight people transferring 
uh, tapes into FLAC. And we've recruited some of those eight because as part of the acquisitions that the OTRR has made um, has been the uh, um, donation of uh, recording equipment and a lot of broadcast equipment. A lot of the broadcast equipment we're able to sell to finance all of these things. But if, if you have interest in working on transferring tapes, you can get a working reel-to-reel -reel deck to help you do it for basically the shipping cost. We have two people who've, who've done it so far, one of whom was just freshly retired and was looking for a, a hobby to, to stay engaged uh, with the hobby, with our hobby, uh, while he was retired. Um, if you have any kind of experience using Audacity and cloud storage, uh, there's stuff for you. You don't have to get involved in transferring tape. Uh, we are transferring perhaps um, a thousand recordings a week. I mean, it's, it's, it's stunning what's going on. We also need people to organize them uh, by series and to make sure they have the right file names. And we have all the resources necessary to do it, but somebody has to physically do it on their computer. And for that, you get access to all of the recordings that have been converted and a lot of the collections that come of it. And you also get to work with a lot of interesting people which means that uh, there are a lot more people who are interesting beyond me, that's for sure. Um, and what we try to do as we go through these reels, if you have an interest in detective programs, we will send you just detective programs. If you're like me, if you have interest in suspense and the Whistler and you want to just work on those series, I get the suspense and the Whistler reels. So we try to match that up as much as possible with, with everyone. So if you have any interest in any aspect of this, this project is going to go on for at least uh, three to five years. Um, it's, uh, it's a really great contribution to the hobby. Uh, all of the programs are going to be made uh, for, to, available to everyone. And we're looking to put everything up on uh, in the Internet Archive so it is there at a place that will outlive all of us with all of our research. So that's, that's my uh, last statement on that. And... I just wanted to uh, thank you again very much and open it up to uh, Q&A.